So thank you very much, Derek. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and to be able to uh, talk about um, some of the things that we found in our research at Ezoic. So uh, I'll drive with the keyboard. So uh, um, a little bit about myself. Um, I did my, my PhD not too far from here in, in Switzerland, actually, in uh, theoretical biophysics, where I did mathematical modeling of the nervous system. And uh, then I went to the University of Wisconsin, where I was uh, actually working in a neuroscience lab, um, where we were studying cardiac arrhythmias and how the nervous system can actually um, influence and drive uh, the heartbeat. And uh, now that I'm at Ezoic, it was actually kind of a natural transition um, from neuroscience into artificial intelligence, uh, because uh, artificial intelligence is really sort of built off of these principles uh, that we know and uh, we know from neuroscience. And so this is actually a, a cardiac. Uh, ventricular action potential um, on the right of the screen here. And, and really what that is, um, is it's, this is the impulse that is sent that uh, determines when the, heart is be when the heart should beat. And it comes like once per second or 60 beats per minute, 60 times per second. This signal here at the top um, no, uh, is, uh, regulates the heartbeat. And what that actually is, is it's composed of a bunch of ions um, that flow through, and the resulting signal is the sum of all of uh, the signals that come through. So we have all these different ion channels here that are controlling the heartbeat. And as you can see in the background, um, individual like cardiomyocytes, heart muscle cells will spontaneously beat by themselves because this, this, these signals are being sent. So um, to kind of extend this into like how artificial intelligence works, um, well, in artificial intelligence, we're we're basically taking all of these different signals and using this the same principle of a weighted sum. And through a lot of different math techniques, uh, these, uh, the computer can actually start to learn how to optimize and understand what signals are the most important and figure out how to make sense of data. So we can actually um, do this to do all sorts of uh, interesting things, like you know, there's cars that are out driving themselves through AI. Um, but for like a base case, we can use an example of a dog. Um, so how can we like classify a dog and use artificial intelligence to learn um, what a dog is? And we can say, well, a dog, we can make a model and say it's four different things. It's an animal, it's a mammal, it barks, and it walks on four legs. And so uh, a type of algorithm that you can use to sort of um, suss this out is uh, a decision tree. And there's different types of decision trees called like a random forest um, or gradient boosting decision trees, um, where essentially it will pass all of your data of dogs and not dogs through this algorithm and learn what actually, how important these things are, like if it's an animal or a mammal or, and so on. And so if it passes all these checks and says, is it an animal? Yes. Is it a mammal? Yes. Um, does it uh, walk on four legs? Yes. And does it bark? Then we have a dog here. Sometimes this system can go a little bit awry because not every dog has all of these features. So here, uh, this, this guy here is, is still a dog, um, but it would fail in this algorithm. And over time, even though we know that this is a dog, the system will start to learn uh, that this uh, maybe these features are not as important that it walks on four legs because not all dogs will walk on four legs. So the, it'll start to weight these features and say, okay, a dog has to be an animal, it has to be a mammal, it's perhaps less important that it barks, and it's perhaps less important that it walks on four legs, but those are still important to help us maximize our predictive power um, to identify dogs. So this is sort of the framework of artificial intelligence, it's a really simple explanation. Um, but what this actually does and what it enables us to do is it, it flips traditional programming on its head. Because for, um, for you know, ages and since the beginning of programming, you would say, if, if this, then that. And if this, then that. So if A and B, then do this. If A and C, do this. And that starts to become really complicated when we're feeding through lots of information of like complex things, like real, with a lot of different um, situations. Instead, we can say, here's what we know is the end point here are things that maybe are important and all the signals that we have, and now you figure it out to maximize the, our predictive power. We can even throw in other features, like maybe a dog, does it have green eyes? And that will ultimately just be ruled out of the um, equation and we'll know that that's like a false signal. So to actually extend this into more digital publishing and something more relevant, um, there are signals in the data that are very strong, right? We know that click-through rate and viewability are, are key features to determining the price of an impression on a page. And as we can see on this plot, uh, this is a heat map, and 
as it gets darker and darker green, the CPM increases. And we can see that as you increase the CTR, the CPM increases. As you increase the viewability, the CPM increases. And as you move up in this, you know, move in the northeast direction, uh, the CPM is, uh, of course, increasing. Um, and this can actually be used, uh, you know, this can be learned through artificial intelligence of like, what are those key features? This would sort of be your, your animal and mammal features that are describing a CPM. Um, and this can actually start to be used to say like, well, some, some advertisers may be more driven uh, by a conversion rate, so they're uh, gonna weight CTR more heavily than viewability. Um, and so you can start to actually um, learn which advertisers to uh, serve your impressions to. So there's a lot of signals that are actually in the data that are associated with every impression. And so up here is a, a movie of, uh, this is the uh, DFP real-time bidding protocol endpoint. And if you, if you have not been to this page, I highly recommend you go check out uh, this page. There is tons and tons and tons of information of every time a bid is sent through, uh, an advertiser has access to all of this information associated with the impression. So there's tons and tons and tons of information here. And if we actually start to leverage this all together, we can start to get a really um, complex and also very predictive uh, signal and information from, this, from these impressions. And so uh, you may be wondering if advertisers are actually using all of this, and uh, you, you had better believe it that they are using this. So um, this is uh, sort of a, a normalized um, ad exchange, like CPM by state in the United States, and you can see these like really distinct regional um, trends in the data. And this is just a, a slice of time, like I think over a month. Um, and what we can see is like advertisers are keying in on certain higher value users, and uh, there's geographic trends in the data. And so um, for like, you know, if you're like a daily news site or a publisher that's you know, publishing news, this can actually start to become really important because if you have an influx of traffic from Colorado here, uh, if, if you have a major traffic spike because you know, like Colorado legalized uh, marijuana and this is a big news story, so you may get a lot of Colorado traffic, um, if you're selling all those impressions at an average price for the country um, or even at like a Wyoming price, which is just, you know, just across the border, um, you can be leaving a lot of revenue on the table. So as I mentioned before, there's a tons of signals in the data. Um, and some of these things we can control um, and some of the things we cannot. And it uh, looks like we got a little jumbled here. But um, some, so these things that you can control on the, on the publisher side is where the ad is on the, on the page. Um, what size is the ad? Uh, what other things are on the page? How many impressions do you have on the page? Um, there are things that you, you can't really control that just come from the visitor or the user. Um, you know, are they on a, a you know, computer or you know, desktop or mobile or tablet? Um, what type of browser they're using? What their, um, you know, what their historic trends are? Because they, you know, advertisers have all that information from DFP and they also can have a cookie too. So um, at, at Ezoic, uh, we, we really like to think of things you know, beyond just the impression level. Um, and we like to think on like the, the session level, um, sort of actually think about, you know, just instead of optimizing for a CPM, we like to optimize for the whole, the whole visit. And so we use this metric called EPMV, um, and EPMV is earnings per thousand visitors. Um, so this is the sum of all of the CPMs for the visit. Um, so this is, yeah, all your CPMs times the number of page views, um, and that gives you like your actual EPMV. And we like to do this because um, we, if, you, if you optimize just within one impression, uh, you can start to leave things on the table. And the reason why we do this is we have found that um, ultimately user experience is, is the number one driving force um, to uh, optimize for revenue. And um, you know, as, as a physicist, I, I, my, my, my background in physics, I wish I could come up here and say, here's the law, um, the law is use five impressions per page and uh, only use native on a social referral. And I, I wish I could tell you that, but it, the, the fact of the matter is, is it's just not that simple. Um, but what we, the ones, or the, the strongest correlations that we found um, to increasing revenue are these classic user experience metrics, bounce rate, page views per visit, time on site. And so ultimately we realized that by, op um, by optimizing for the user experience, uh, we can actually, um, have our largest increase in uh, revenue. So uh, some data that can, we can show that uh, kind of justifies this is, um, here's time on site uh, versus revenue for that, that page view. 
And we see this really sharp increase um, pretty much in the first 20 seconds on the page. Um, so basically, if they're not leaving uh, quickly and they're actually staying on the page, um, the longer that users stay on the page, the more revenue that is ultimately associated with that page view. Um, there's some underlying reasons for this, but ultimately what, what's kind of at the, at the core here is that um, engaging content um, means that the impressions are staying on the page longer and advertisers are, are you know, benefiting from that. And so by having this engaging content that keeps the users on the page, uh, you'll ultimately drive up your revenue. Similarly, page views per visit. Um, we see a really strong correlation uh, between the number of page views per visit um, and the total revenue uh, for, that, uh, for, that visit, for that session. So here uh, on this publisher, uh, this is the same publisher on the left and the right, uh, mobile and desktop. And uh, what's really fascinating about this is we can see on the first few page views here on mobile and desktop, the first three or four, there's the highest return on um, revenue and revenue growth. Um, so we see this really critical point where before it starts to flatten off um, or be, take this linear shape, uh, we see this huge increase. So getting them to go from the first page to the second page is a great way to maximize the, uh, the value of that user. So also I mentioned bounce rate. And bounce rate, of course, is kind of the, um, the enemy here where uh, that's, that puts an end to your, your time on site and your page views per visit. And so this is uh, one of our publishers, and they have this really interesting pattern where up to about six impressions per page, the bounce rate is relatively flat, and then you go to seven, and the bounce rate roughly doubles, and then you go to eight, and it um, almost tripled from six. Uh, so you, know, this, you may think like, wow, okay, this is great, great information, we can put six, uh, six impressions per page, and uh, maybe run an A-B test, and uh, you know, just to prove that. And there's actually a, a bit of a problem with the A-B testing methodology um, and, and that is, you, when you run an A-B test, you'll run it and you'll say, okay, I have 60% um, 60 of the time version A wins, 40% of the time version B wins, so A is a clear winner and I'll go ahead and run with that. Um, so you, you have an A-B test and you, you use an AA implementation. Um, and so this is sort of following the, the uh, framework or sort of the law of San Diego, um, or philosophy in San Diego, where 60% of the time it works every time, and we can do better than that. So uh, this is where AI can really come into play, uh, because AI is a dynamic way to actually test and learn and optimize beyond just the A-B level. So you can start at six, and the system will start to explore how many, what happens if I use seven impressions? What happens if I use five impressions? And what if I do it among different types of users? And how does that affect bounce rate? And ultimately, um, if we think of bounce rate more as a probability, when a user comes to the page, uh, there's a certain probability that I'm going to bounce, so there's a probability that I'm not. And um, so that's this distribution here that we see on the left, and um, there's, this is the average bounce rate. That's the, that's the average bounce rate. Now, what you may see is users on an iPhone will come to the page, and for whatever reason, as over time, as you accumulate more data, you'll notice that the iPhone users in blue are bouncing with a higher probability. And you start to become more certain and more certain as you get more and more of that data. And now the equation starts to shift. And you can say, well, if iPhone users are bouncing with a higher propensity than other users, like Android users, um, maybe it's worth sacrificing one impression on that first initial page view to influence them to go to the subsequent page view. Um, so you can hit that critical point of going from one page view to two page views. And AI will ultimately learn and become more certain um, of these trends over time. So uh, to summarize, this is, this is sort of what we know and what we've found in all of our research, um, is that user experience and digital revenue are absolutely tied. Um, and if you start to tailor and step away from the A-B testing framework and embrace the digital, you know, this, the power of the digital um, medium, where you can run tests on the fly and tailor your tests to individual users, um, you can actually start to account for those differences. That 40% that B population who actually liked version B, you can deliver them version B. And this is really where ultimately where we think AI fits into the digital publishing. There's so many ways to slice up the data and there's so much data that's available and within, uh, within your data set that are associated with your impressions on the publishing side, um, this is really the, the future of, of digital publishing. And um, yeah, so thank you for your time. And Thanks, thanks for letting me speak to you. It's a pleasure.